One day, I woke up and, like many other normal people, I felt like simulating rocket trajectories. I did something like this in college for a class, but that was using MATLAB, and MATLAB is expensive. You know what's not expensive? Python. Because it's free. So I downloaded Python, and after fumbling around a bit more, I downloaded a popular program for writing Python scripts called PyCharm. I then watched some YouTube videos on how to code in Python, and it's actually pretty straightforward. Just a disclaimer, in case it's not immediately obvious, I am not a software engineer, nor am I a highly skilled coder, so if you're one of those types, you might not get a ton out of this video, but if you're more interested in physics and rockets, you hopefully will. Also, there seems to be a choir of birds operating at full force outside my window, and it's perhaps intermingled with some police sirens, so I apologize if you can hear any of that. Anyways, Python doesn't come with sophisticated math tools out of the box, but you can download several packages to make it so. SciPy, Matplotlib, and NumPy. Or, as I say in my head every time I read it in the code, NumPy. NumPy gives you most mathematical operations like sine, cosine, etc. Matplotlib gives tools to plot data, and SciPy contains the differential equation solver that we'll need. Don't worry if you don't know what a differential equation is, I'll try to keep the actual math fairly light while still giving enough info for those who are interested to dive in. Anyways, I use the Python command pip through the command prompt to install these, which always makes me think of Pippin and Mary. I then found example code on how to solve differential equations using solve IPP, stole it, or borrowed it for testing purposes, and it ran. All looks good from this code that I didn't make. But still, from here on out, it's all me. I'm not going to get into too much of the code itself, but basically it's built around the function solve IVP, and all the code before that is setting out the differential equations and initial conditions, which can be quite extensive for something like a rocket, and all the code after that is plotting the solution. So, I guess it's time to talk about a little bit of physics and math. As with many areas of physics, we'll start with the fabled equation, force equals mass times acceleration. Velocity is the first time derivative of position, which is either represented as something like dx dt or x dot, and acceleration is the second time derivative of position, represented like this or as x double dot. So we can say f equals mx double dot. If the force and mass are constant, we can integrate this twice, and we get this equation. If this looks familiar, it's probably because it is, it's one of the kinematic equations. This is a closed form analytical solution, meaning the differential equation can be solved by hand with an exact solution. Many differential equations have complex solutions that can still be calculated by hand, but many others, for example when force or mass are not constant in f equals ma, simply do not have calculatable exact solutions and the solution must be acquired through brute force methods of just stepping through time and calculating the answer at each step. Luckily, we tricked lumps of silicone into thinking for us, so we don't need to do any of the hard work ourselves. Before going directly to rockets, let's calculate the speed and position of a rock as it falls, but we'll add something high school physics textbooks can only have night terrors about. Air resistance. For us humans doing this math by hand, it's more or less impossible, but for that lump of silicone in our computer, laboring away under the yoke of its suppressors, it's a piece of cake. The equation for air resistance, also known as drag, is this. Note that it's dependent on v, the velocity squared. If we add this to f equals ma, this is the differential equation. Note on the left side we have x dot squared, and on the right side we have x double dot. This differential equation cannot be solved analytically with an exact solution. Let's write a script that solves this. Luckily for us, I already did that, so you don't need to sit around and watch me type. Basically, in order to use solve IVP, we need to split the second order differential equation into two coupled first order differential equations. We defined velocity as the first derivative of position, v equals x dot, and then the acceleration as the first derivative of velocity a equals v dot. 
Anyways, here's the code for defining the differential equation and the solve IVP. I use some if statements because I wanted initial velocity to be able to oppose gravity and have the ball being launched upward, so it's just a quick and dirty way to make sure drag always points the right way. For the rocket trajectory, we'll solve this problem by defining our differential equations in a coordinate system that moves with the rocket. And here's the solution. The left plot is position, the right plot is velocity. I started by launching the ball upward, so it goes up, reverses, and then falls down. The effect of air resistance is extremely obvious because you can see in the velocity plot it levels off around 30 meters per second. This is the terminal velocity of the rock, or max falling speed, or the point when the air resistance is equal to gravity. I also did some other simulations, like a 2D version of this that creates a trajectory, as you can see here, as well as a spring mass damper system that makes some satisfying boyoyoings, but I think we've wasted enough time already, so let's get into the rockets. If you've ever watched footage of a rocket launch, which if you haven't, feast your eyes upon what's on screen right now, you'll note how the rocket does not just fly straight up. It does for a bit, but generally pretty shortly after launch it starts to pitch over, and by the time it's in space the rocket is nearly entirely turned over and parallel with the ground. So what's going on here? It's something called a gravity turn. Burning straight up will get you into space, but not for very long. You'll go up, turn around, and come back down. Hence the age-old adage, what goes up must come down. And that's still true with spacecraft to an extent, they're just moving forward so fast that they constantly fall around the planet. A gravity turn is the most efficient way to get up to altitude above the Earth's atmosphere while gaining the speed necessary to continually fall around the planet or orbit. Technically, if the Earth had no atmosphere, a spacecraft could orbit a foot off the ground, though things like hills, mountains, buildings, and people may get in the way. Anywho, most rockets fly straight up for a bit, then upon reaching some altitude, usually a few kilometers or less, the guidance program initiates a pitch-over maneuver by gimbling the rocket engines. I'll probably do a video on rocket engines at some point when I feel like it, but basically most can gimbal or change the direction of the nozzle to provide torque to the spacecraft. The pitch-over is the only phase of the launch in which the thrust of the rocket is not aligned with its direction of flight, and thrust is used to physically turn the rocket. After the rocket reaches some predetermined angle, only gravity is used to turn the rocket, and the thrust is always aligned along the path of the trajectory. Let's revisit the math. Like I said earlier, let's set up our f equals ma in the coordinate system that rides along with the rocket. It's helpful to do this visually. Here's the rocket above the Earth, and we're done. If only. Anyways, the rocket is at a height of h above the surface. The radius of Earth is constant for our purposes, so the distance from the rocket to the center of the Earth is the radius of Earth plus height. The r direction, which connects the rocket to the center of the Earth, is the direction of gravity. We can also create the angle theta, which is the downrange angle from the launch site to the current position of the rocket. Let's now define the t direction, which is along the axis of the rocket and therefore, by definition of a gravity turn, is aligned with the current trajectory. The n direction is perpendicular to it. If we define two more angles, psi, also known as the flight path angle or how pitched over the rocket is, as well as phi, the angle between the launch site vertical and the current direction of the rocket, we can finally define the equations for a gravity turn fairly easily. I'm not going to go through all the derivations, but I'll put a picture of the math on screen right now. Anyone who likes this sort of thing can pause and maybe follow along if they'd like. Basically, we have five equations. Two of them are derived directly from the f equals ma math, splitting the vector up into the t and n directions. This first one gives v dot, or acceleration along the trajectory, and this other one gives phi dot, the rate of change of the angle of the rocket measured with respect to the launch pad vertical. The other three equations are derived by inspection of the geometry that we set up and give us h dot, theta dot, and psi dot. Okay, let's finally jump over to the code. Here are the inputs and initial conditions. For this project, I'm using data on the Titan II rocket used for the Gemini program. We have the drag and area, all the initial masses, the length of the burn, which is actually not the real time, we'll get to that later, 
m dot, which is the rate at which mass changes, the thrust of the rocket in newtons, and the altitude in which we engage the pitch over. Then down here we have our initial conditions, as well as our time vector, which in later iterations of the simulation I actually found out is not needed. Then we define our differential equations, starting by pulling out the current answers from the vector that contains the solution. Then we define the gravity, g, and the air density, rho, based on the altitude, and the drag force, d, based on the velocity and air density. Here, we set the thrust if the time is less than the burn time that we define. If not, it's zero. The mass of the rocket is also defined here. Now, the equations themselves. Before the gravity turn height, the rate of change of our two angles is zero, the rate of change of the velocity has no angle associated with it, and the rate of change of height is just velocity. After the gravity turn, we use the five equations defined earlier. And finally, we return our four derivatives. And the next line, solve IVP, calls this function, including initial and end times, initial conditions, and evaluation range, which, like I said before, is more or less useless. And if we run it, we get this. The plot in the top left shows the rocket's height versus time, and the plot immediately below it shows velocity versus time. You can tell when the rocket stops burning when the velocity is no longer sharply increasing. Below the velocity is the flight path angle, or the angle of the rocket. Top right is a polar plot that shows the trajectory on the Earth, and the two plots below that show downrange distance versus time and height respectively. Now, this is all well and good, but the rocket is still on a collision course with Earth. I want to model a rocket that goes all the way up to orbit. The Titan II Gemini launch vehicle is a two-stage rocket, so I need to expand the code to allow that. It wasn't too hard, I just needed a lot more if statements for the thrust to define periods of burning on the first stage, second stage, a coasting period, and a final burn. Along the way, I encountered some problems and bugs that I was able to squash. For example, for a long time, I was defining my mass incorrectly, causing the rocket to be way heavier than it should have been for the final burn, leading to a head-scratchingly high burn time. The biggest problem I encountered and managed to fix was something I already alluded to, the time vector doing nothing. It turns out that vector input only changes the number of points that are reported for the solution and not the actual solution steps. I noticed that some combinations of times for coasting, burning, and total simulation time would produce totally different results, and in some cases the solution would entirely skip over the final burn. No matter how many zeros I added to the time vector, nothing changed until I finally figured out that in order to set the actual time step in the calculation, you need to use the max step input, and it had nothing to do at all with the time vector. In coasting phases with no thrust and almost no drag, the solution was fairly simple for the solver, so it was taking huge time steps on the order of 30 seconds and, in some cases, skipping entirely past a short 10 to 15 second burn. I think that there's a way around this using T or Y events in the solver, but for this version of the code, I just decided to set the maximum time step to one second. It doesn't really affect performance on my machine, even simulating two hours runs in about five seconds. Oh, and one more unrelated thing, I also added the rotation of the Earth to theta dot, since all rockets start with that extra little kick. Okay, moment of truth, here's the final solution. After tweaking the pitch over height, pitch over angle, and burn times, we have a fairly reasonable orbit for a Gemini mission. I found some historical data and an orbit that has a maximum altitude of about 250 kilometers and a minimum altitude of 150 kilometers is right on the money. Here's a zoomed in plot of the velocity during the burns. You can see a large slope change here caused by the drop and thrust from staging, the coasting period here, and then the final kick into orbit right here. Here's a zoomed in plot of the trajectory. You can see the ascent path of the rocket as well as the following orbit above it. So how accurate is this? Well, I found data that says the Gemini first stage had 156 seconds of burn time, which I used exactly, and the second stage had 180 seconds of burn time. My code had the rocket making it into orbit with 203.5 seconds of burn time on the second stage. So, for total burn time, we're about 7% off. I think this is explainable due to a few factors. 
I only spent a relatively short amount of time tweaking burn times, coast time, and pitch over height and angle, so it's probably not the completely optimized trajectory. Also, I can't find any data or information online if the Titan II rocket throttled the engines at all, but if they did, that could be another source of error. And finally, the drag equation is relatively simplistic, particularly treating drag coefficient as a constant over all velocities, so that could either be underestimating or overestimating the performance. Now, before I go, I know some people would want to see a launch into a highly elliptical orbit, so here it is. Check out how much the height varies over time and the polar plot on the top right. Anyways, I think that will just about do us for now. I'll probably revisit this project in the future, perhaps to make improvements to the sources of error that I discuss, or maybe to make new features. Maybe something like a user interface to use the program might be cool, but I'm thinking more like solving a trajectory for a lunar mission like Apollo. Like I said in the last video, this channel is called Miscellaneous Bits because I'm going to be making lots of different types of miscellaneous bits of content about whatever I feel like in the realm of engineering, space, or aviation. If that sounds interesting to you, please take a subscription under advisement. Bye.